The Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing efforts throughout rural America. Since 1971, HAC has provided below market financing for affordable housing and community development activities, technical assistance and training, research and information, and policy formulation to enable solutions for rural communities. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a leadership initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Housing Assistance Council. Focusing on communities with populations of 50,000 or less, CERD's goal is to enhance the quality of life and economic vitality of rural America through planning, design, and creative place making. Welcome to today's webinar, Building Momentum for Your Long-Term Vision. What are quick and small arts and design-based activities that can help your community members and partners rally around bigger design projects? How can storytelling help with engagement and collective visioning? Today's webinar will discuss approaches and tactics to build support for design projects across rural America. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts for sponsoring today's webinar and the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. Today's first presenter, Jun Lee Wang, is a connector of people, places, and ideas. As an Associate Director of Programs, Jun Lee leads strategy and programs at Springboard for the Arts, with a focus on partnership development and community building. For nine years, she created and led Springboard's community development program, including Irrigate, a national rec nationally recognized creative placemaking program designed to train and support local artists to address community challenges. She recently completed her third toolkit for Springboard, the Handbook for Artists Working in Community. June Lee has received multiple grants for her projects, St. Paul Hello, an initiative for welcoming newcomers, and Board Repair, the network supporting people of color on nonprofit boards. June Lee holds a BA from Vassar College and an MPS in International Development from Cornell University. And though she has lived in Minnesota longer than any other place, some of her heart remains in Berkeley, her childhood home. When time permits, Junie is a craft artist with guerrilla art in aspirations. Today's second presenter, Emily Schmidt, is an Emmy award-winning journalist and communications consultant who has told stories while floating in the air, wading through flood waters, and covering the race for the President of the United States. Emily is based in Washington, D.C. and works as a freelance correspondent for CNN News Source, covering news for clients around the world. As a communications consultant, Emily uses her experience finding and delivering powerful stories to help clients do the same. She has led media training, public speaking, and crisis management training for organizations in the, in the United States and on five continents. Emily has coached a client for the TED Talk main stage. She helped another lead of one of the most watched Harvard Business Review Facebook live sessions and uses her storytelling skills to craft videos, content, content, and manage strategy for companies of all sizes. Emily grew up on an Iowa farm and graduated from the University of Missouri School, and School of Journalism. She and her husband enjoy traveling with their teenage sons and after completing visits to all 50 states, the family is tackling visiting the seven continents. Now I'd like to turn over the stage to my colleague, Terry Charleston, for some brief welcome remarks. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I am Shantaria Charleston, the Director of Technical Assistance and Training here at the Housing Assistance Council. Um, on behalf of the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, or CIRD, C-I-R-D, and the Housing Assistance Council, Welcome to the Building Momentum for Your Long-Term Vision webinar. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a leadership initiative of the National Endowment of the Arts carried out here at the Housing Assistance Council in partnership with our design expert friends at To Be Done Studios. The Housing Assistance Council is a 50-year-old national rural housing organization that focuses on affordable housing development and preservation, nonprofit capacity building, rural research and policy, and more recently, Rural Design and Creative Placemaking via the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. The Housing Assistance Council and our partners continue to reap the benefits from rural design and creative placemaking intersects with the broader rural development field. And that's why we're super excited for today's webinar. To get us started, I'll quickly introduce and turn over to Jen Hughes. Jen is the Director of Design and Creative Placemaking at the National Endowments of the Arts. She is a champion for ensuring that rural and tribal communities are part of the National Rural Design 
design and creative placemaking conversations. Jen will share a bit more about the Citizens Institute on Rural Design background and then uh, go into uh, today's presentation. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Shantaria. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be with you all today. Um, Jen Hughes, Director of Design and Creative Placemaking and the National Endowment for the Arts. And I just wanted to welcome everybody before we dive into this really exciting session and to also offer a special shout out to acknowledge the Citizens Institute on Rural Design Learning Cohort Communities. This is a group of rural places that applied for support from CERD and they have been charging forward with bold design vision for their communities. The National Down for the Arts is so pleased to be working in partnership with the Housing Assistance Council and To Be Done Studio on the CIRD program. Um, as the lovely introduction that you all sort of heard about, CERD delivers uh, supports rural America by supporting the execution of local design workshops each year and facilitating a design learning cohort of roughly 20 communities that engage in peer learning, training and design, planning, community engagement with support of one on one technical assistance on their community design challenge and vision. And I think that this program best exemplifies the National Endowment for the Arts deep commitment to serving rural and tribal communities across the country. So if you are hearing about us for the first time, I encourage you to check out our website, rural-design.org and learn a little bit more. So we are just so honored to be in the presence of two extraordinary national thought leaders presenting today. As you heard in their introductions, they both share a deep commitment to rural communities and rich creative practices. And I think this promises to be a really fun, inspiring and engaging session. So I am going to turn it over to our presenters uh, and echo uh, a resounding thanks to June Lee and Emily for being with us today. All right. Well, thank you for the introductions. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, I just want to share. So Emily and I are kind of tag teaming it today uh, and I'll be doing a short presentation with some slides and then Emily will pick up from there uh, and talk to us more about storytelling and how to share the stories of the things that we do. And then we'll leave. Uh, we'll have some activities and we'll leave time for Q&A. So that's sort of the flow of the next hour and 20 minutes. Um, as I talk, if you wouldn't mind dropping into chat both uh, introduction, introductions of yourself, but also what are you thinking about in your community, in your work, um, in your region? Is there a specific challenge or opportunity at the top of your mind? Is there a specific group or type of people that you'd like to better engage? Um, and as you drop that in there, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, keep talking. Um, so a little bit about myself, Jun Lee Wong, she, her pronouns, and uh, I'm in St. Paul, the uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, um, the land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Uh, Springboard for the Arts is a community and economic development organization that uh, is based from our two offices. So here in St. Paul and also in Fergus Falls, which is a community of 14,000 people in northern Minnesota. So we work from where we are to be part of and contribute in our communities. And we also share what we've learned uh, with nationwide, uh, with other communities to catalyze similar work. And our work is really centered around the power of artists and creatives in our community. Um, so before I, I get into a little bit of the sort of activities that we promised to talk about, I wanted to back up and share some definitions that we use uh, so that you understand what, as I talk what I'm talking about. Um, so the first one is when we talk about artists, we mean people who consider themselves artists, you know, who are full time, who are collected, uh, by galleries who win big commissions. And we also mean people who carve spoons or who sing in community choir, knit for family, cook, style hair. So all of those people are artists in our work and to us. And this means a couple of things. One, it means that in every community, there are a million artists uh, on every block, every apartment building, every couple acres in a rural place, there are creative people. And creative people are notable for not only making and producing, I think that's usually what we think of when we think of artists, right? They create sculpture or mural, uh, maybe they make a performance, uh, something like that. But what we also really want people to recognize is that artists use a creative process. Artists take information, materials, ideas, conversation, 
musings and they weave them into something else that also has meaning and that helps people think in a different way. And then they learn from that and they have conversations with people or they watch how people interact with the work and they do it again, but the, a little bit differently. So it's that iterative process that we think artists really can bring and should bring to the challenges that we have at hand, right? Nothing is perfect uh, and we're in the middle of a long pandemic. Uh, that has only highlighted the disparities uh, between people and communities and systems. And so we believe that artists really need to be centered in change because they're going to help us think differently about what we have been doing and doing incorrectly for a very long time. So that's our definition of artists. Um, we also talk a lot about local in our work and really recognizing that not only wherever you are, there are assets, including the people, um, but local, when you work with local artists, it means those artists have a bond to the place. They maybe have a long history with the place. Maybe they have a new history. They're authentic to that area. They represent the communities that are already there. And so in the work that I'm going to talk about, it's really focused on um, tapping into and supporting your local artists. That isn't to say that there isn't a role for out, out artists coming from elsewhere or if you're an artist going somewhere. Um, but in the work that I'm going to share, it's really about the local artists. So when we first started this work 10 years ago, um, we said, you know, often, often you have an opportunity where maybe a community or an organization gets ten or twenty thousand dollars to hire an artist to do a thing. Um, and traditionally, you would put out one call for an artist, and you would, you know, get a bunch of applications. You'd set, select one artist or an artist team, and they there'd be some kind of, you know, uh, fanfare around their selection. They would do the work. There'd be fanfare around the completion or the unveiling, and of course, there might, you know, there'd be the the artistic piece. And we said, well, what if you took that 10 or 20,000 and instead of funding one artist or artist team, what if you funded 10 or 20 different artists? So these artists would be different ages, different art forms, different uh, you know, experiences and backgrounds, different interests. And what if you funded them to do very small, modest projects in collaboration with organizations, with businesses, with different groups, in the community, what would happen? So we started with that question. And what we found was amazing, amazing things um, that started with very small, modest projects. So I will talk about some of those. And I know many of you are thinking about some kind of long-term plan uh, that you know, you're hoping to move your community towards uh, over the next few years. And small projects like this can get you to building relationships and to get you to places where you're in touch with more people um, who can who can respond. Sorry, I hear feedback. Um, who can. Liza says she doesn't know. Hey, June Lee, I think you might have muted yourself. June Lee, I think you've muted yourself. How long have I been muted? <laughs> uh, 30 seconds, maybe. OK, since this slide. OK, I'm just going to start over with this slide. Basically, Julie, just with, at the point where you said you thought somebody you were hearing feedback, that was when you went quiet. OK, okay thanks. Um, I'm just going to start over with this slide. So two of the things that situations or, or context that I wanted to share with you were um, this construction of a street that were that really uh, impacted the small businesses on this street. And then the second slide is of the Kirkbride, which is a mental health institution uh, in Fergus Falls, uh, right, right near downtown, um, that was decommissioned uh, and is large enough to practically house everyone in town, um, but has deep uh, meaning, 
to this community. So these were two of the sort of larger contexts that we were facing uh, 10 years ago when we started to do work in communities. So um, let's see. June Lee, I'm going to ask you, this is Courtney, I'm going to ask you to pause just one second. I see there's a note in the chat that someone can't see June Lee's slides. Is that true for others? Can you guys raise a hand or is it just an isolated case? I can see it. So, okay, it looks like we're okay other than maybe just Allison. Okay, she's back. Oh, no. Okay, some okay. people can see them. Yep, we're good. Right. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, all right, great. Thanks, everyone. Oh, yep. Yeah. So you might have to pin the tile says Adrian. Um, so I'm going to share a series of small projects, but you know, over the last 10 years, we've supported hundreds and hundreds of artists across different communities to do small projects. And I'm talking about $500 to $1,500 um, for a project. And over the years, we've been tracking them and tracking the impact. And so I just wanted to share some language with you before I actually jump into the small, to the examples of the impacts overall. So this is what happens when you engage artists in working in their communities. And no, you aren't asking for them to create this, but this is what happens when you do this. So they, so the three buckets, the first bucket is changing and enhancing community narrative and identity. So oftentimes um, the stories that come out of sharing these artist projects help a community see itself differently internally. They see their neighbors, they see their community members being active, being leaders with a small L, inviting them to do things, helping people connect, right? So there's an internal understanding of how a community is and how it functions. And then there's also an external view of a community or a place. And so these projects can mm -hmm. help outsiders understand what is happening in a place and what's, you know, unusual about it, what's interesting why they should go or why they should pay attention. The second bucket is building social capital and diversifying cross-sector networks. And the social capital is really, you know, when artists do projects, they bring people together. Sometimes that is the stated purpose, other times it isn't. But especially these days, and I think uh, as, as this pandemic goes on and on, we're recognizing that people who know other people in their community, they don't even have to be good friends, right? Just by knowing more people in your community, you are going to do better in times of trauma and stress. During Hurricane Katrina, even the poorest communities, the ones where people knew each other better, they were able to survive better because they took care of each other. They checked in on their neighbors. They, you know, help each other move around. So social capital is huge these days. Um, and, oh, I'm gonna skip that. Um, and then diversifying cross-sector networks. So working with artists pulls in different sectors. So all of a sudden you're working with an artist who's working with the neighborhood organization, who's working with the transportation agency, right? And by sort of mingling these different ideas and sectors, you get something different and you get something stronger. And then the last large bucket, is community health and economic vitality. So community health from things like physical, getting people outside, giving people places to walk, uh, to having people share stories of happiness and of sorrow, right? Mental health is huge. Uh, and then economic vitality. So you'll see some examples of this where working with artists brings vitality to an area, increases the local economy um, by drawing attention and, and helping people understand that if they support their local businesses, that benefits their community. So I'll jump into a few projects here. All right, my little advance arrow disappeared. I'm hoping it moved to us moved. Okay. Um, so this is so this is the Kirkbride, which is a mental health institution that got decommissioned. And in Fergus Falls, um, when it was decommissioned, it became this very large building that had no other purpose. Um, yet everyone in town had some relationship to the Kirkbride, whether they worked there or you know somebody in the family worked there. Many people knew residents who had been there. 
um, for some period. And it was very controversial. So you may have in your community something that's controversial. Um, so people are a little bit bound up about, you know, how do we talk about this when people felt like they were on different sides of the issue? Should the building remain? Should it be demolished when it had this history? Um, and uh, an artist, Naomi Schliesman, said, did a project that was a simple chalkboard in the silhouette of the Kirkbride. So everybody you know, recognizes that silhouette. And she asked the question, what else is possible? A simple question, but a way to open up conversation and change the way people could talk about the Kirkbride. This was just a beginning project. Over the years, there were many more projects around the Kirkbride and in Fergus Falls, but literally this relatively simple project and that question of what else is possible changed how people could communicate and and more things happened from there i can't tell you all the stories of everything but I'm trying to keep it sort of short um this is a wayfinding project so this was in in saint paul and in one neighborhood um, people were recognized that often folks go to this one coffee shop um, you know, for breakfast or for brunch, and they don't realize that just halfway down the block or around the corner are some local businesses, a hardware store, a bakery, you know, a small, um, a small clothing store. And they said, well, how do we help people who come to the baker, to the coffee shop, understand that, you know, a couple minutes away, like you don't have to get in your car to drive to the mall or to the business district. Right here, there are all of these things. So this project, the artist did, um, you know, got these bicycles, uh, worked with a sign maker and created these different bicycles that were installed both by that bakery and at a couple other nodes in the neighborhood. And the beauty of this project was she did each bicycle with a different group of people in the community. So one group was with a youth group, another group, you know, was, was with another subset of folks in the neighborhood. And so all of a sudden those people become became much more aware of their environment and what their neighborhood had to offer. They also talked with one another about, you know, what does it mean to walk somewhere? What does it mean to bicycle somewhere? How could it be easier or harder to bike, right? Because we all know sometimes biking isn't that easy and, and even walking sometimes if you don't have sidewalks, right? So they had conversations around that. Um, and people also, of course, were proud of these bicycles. So they took friends to go see the bicycles. So it just created momentum, it created conversation, and it helped businesses, um, it helped bring attention to different businesses. In this project, an artist decided to create her own residency at an intersection, at a fairly busy intersection. And uh, she did a number of activities around the bus stop and this intersection. And one of the things, one of the reasons I like to share this is there was a bus stop there um, and she asked people, what else could this bus stop be, right? Usually in, in transit world, we think of, you know, that's where you wait for the bus. And people talked about community and talking to, you know, strangers and talking to the people that they always saw at the bus stop at the same time. Um, and right there was also uh, a senior housing development. It was pretty new at the time that this artist took up residency. And she learned from the senior residents that they didn't have time to cross the street. Like they were always, the, the light wasn't green for long enough. And so they were always rushed and always felt very stressed about that. And so the information she learned from people who were just using this area, she gave to the transit agency and they made some actual changes based on the things that she learned. This project is called the Mobile Sign Shop. Um, and here the artist, Peter, he sort of riffed off of cabin country. So where you get to a fork in the road and there's a pole and it has, you know, the Olsons, you go that way and the whoever go the other direction. Uh, and he, he started doing this on blocks in neighborhoods. And so there'll be a house with a pole and the pole will have all of the neighbors names, you know, and sort of pointing in the different directions. And it was both a way to bring people together in the moment to create their own signs and talk about the history of their family name, their history in the neighborhood, you know, how long, how long they knew some of the neighbors. Um, and as I think probably many of you have experienced, sometimes when you have one thing to work on, you end up talking about many other things, right? So by design, 
in his project, people would talk a little bit about their, their families because of the last name. Um, but people would end up getting to know each other in a very different way because they were also working on something. So it felt sort of, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, now you must learn about each other but is centered around this activity. He then uh, has used this project in many different ways, including with vacant spaces. So helping people envision like, here's this empty lot, here's this spur of land that the Department of Transportation owns, what else could happen here? And so people can envision that and they can put it on a sign and put it in place so other people can also see what else could happen here. This is, uh, this project um, was around, a number of artists did projects on this building that was slated to be demolished and it, it became demolished. Um, and this was gonna be the site of uh, an Asian plaza. Um, and the, the chalkboard on the top left there is something for passersby to use and says, you know, what else, what could be here? What would you like to see? Um, people in this community who walk by, what would you like to see here? And so that information was turned over to the developers as, as they designed that space for later use. Um, also, the artists who are involved in this, many times artists uh, who do this work are doing things that they're very familiar with, right? Like the, the painter who did those murals, she does painting. That part is very easy for her. Um, in this case, she was able to put it do it in a place that had meaning to her. So sometimes it's for artists to do something that they always do, but to be very intentional about where they're able to do it. Um, and for her, this was also a, a growth moment where then she um, became recognized uh, more and more as a muralist. So she's continued to do on, to do many more public projects and actually use other um, mediums as well. I think I have just two more. This one, uh, this one is also a visioning project. I forgot to put a picture here, but there's a vacant building in this community that had been vacant for quite some time, but has historic significance. So people in the community did not want to lose the building um, for its historic significance. Uh, and then they needed to do visioning. And, you know, traditionally, you know, there's sort of the traditional way you do visioning. And in this case, the neighborhood organization hired four artists to do modest projects. Um, one of them, like the bottom left corner, was photo shoots. So the artist invited families from the community to come in to get a professional family portrait. And in doing that, they literally went into that vacant space, experienced the space, also got a wonderful family portrait, but had a sense of belonging and a sense of welcome to that vacant building. So they did many projects like this. And then when it came to sort of group visioning, there were all of a sudden, you know, dozens and dozens of people who had experienced the space, who are invested in the idea and who wanted to see it move forward. So really robust um, visioning that then the planners were able to take and turn into business plans and a design for this space. So in a couple of years, we could actually visit it. Um, this is the last set of examples I'll share. This is in Fergus Falls um, and about three, maybe three, four years ago now, the city wanted to do a bunch of public space improvements. Um, and there were people in the community who, who were not, you know, who questioned that. Um, and so one example, uh, so Springboard worked with a group of artists to do a series of pop-up um, events. And so like in the bottom right corner, you can see a picture of kids playing on um, um, slip and slides. And one of the, the things the city wanted to do was do some park improvement. And one of them included a splash pad. And I think Fergus Falls hasn't had, hadn't had a splash pad at that point. So there are a lot of people who said like, what, we don't need a splash pad here. That's not a good use of money. You know, who, we don't have that many families here. Nobody needs a splash pad. So the artists put together this pop-up um, splash pad, right, with, with tarps and PVC pipes and a sprinkler. And people came. Children came, families came, people had a great time. And so people understood, oh, this is what happens when you have that kind of amenity. Uh, the bottom left corner is a, a favorite project to talk about. Um, here we have uh, an AstroTurf parklet and it's on two parking spots in what was a large parking lot that is adjacent to the main street. And right beyond this um, parklet is actually a river 
that runs parallel to Main Street. And it's a little, it's downhill from here. And the city wanted to take part of the parking lot and turn it into green space, both for people to use, of course, but also to connect people to the river down below. A um, lot of people were concerned about losing parking. I think that's common everywhere. People don't like to lose parking. Um, so they were concerned about that. Businesses were you know, concerned that people wouldn't have a place to park and come visit them. And so the artists did this, you know, they rolled out the AstroTurf, a few logs and a couple signs that said, you know, hey, come hang out. And they didn't staff it. It was just a passive space sitting there. And people started coming and they started stopping to take a rest. A uh, city planner would have lunch there and he would get to meet people in the community who he never would be able to draw to a community meeting at City Hall, you know, who would never answer an online survey. So he got to talk to many people. Other people met other people in the community. And what the businesses also found out is that people wanted a place to rest and that when people were rested, they continued on to the main street to buy things, to eat things, et cetera. So it felt like a you know, win-win for everybody. And indeed, um, this past fall, they broke ground on this project. So we're, we're excitedly waiting for new pictures this spring for that green space. But this is a, you know, over time, artists were able to help people envision, like really feel how spaces could be different. So, um, my time is almost up, but I wanted to share a couple of best practices. When you think about working with artists um, and working in smaller sort of low risk scales. Uh, so I already spoke about working with local artists, broadly defined, working from existing assets and sharing resources. We really see that there are generally many resources around. It's how they're shared and how they're used that can be improved. Um, engage people not often at the table. So as you do your work, really think who's the hardest for you to reach? And then think about who are the creative people in those communities? Who are the artists in those communities? Maybe they're called storytellers or you know, elders or activists or culture bearers. Who are the people that you can engage from those communities through creative practice? Collaborating across sectors I mentioned, um, giving people a common cause Artists are great at doing this, but artists themselves are also interested in working together and moving something uh, forward as a group. Building relationships, I touched on this a little bit. That is actually, I think, really the hidden, um, the hidden work uh, and actually the easy part. But building relationships is what changes things, right? When two people who would normally never have a reason to interact meet one another, and maybe work together. Maybe it's an artist and a staff from a, a city department. When they work together, then all kinds of things sort of blossom from that. Providing simple mechanisms, so making sure things are easy for for people to work together. How do you how do you lower barriers? Um, small and many in this work, we find like the ten or twenty thousand. If you can do more um, modest ones in the beginning, that will lead to you being able to learn what your community is interested in. You'll learn what artists and what organizations really love to do this work. You'll learn you know, what people appreciate and then you can build on that. So starting small and many. Um, and then of course, supporting and paying artists. So not only are you paying artists to do these projects, and when I say artists, right, these are people in your community. So how are you employing them? How are you supporting their employment? Um, and then also how are you supporting additional learning opportunities. Like how do you make sure your contracts are good so that they have good contracts to use going forward? So these are some best practices that we like to share. Um, and I think that's it for my sort of rush presentation. I did just wanna flash this in front of you, um, my organization. And then also we have another technical, um, another training and technical assistance program that uh, shares more models and goes a little more in depth and we welcome you, it's free for artists and there's a small fee for organizations, um, but I wanted to share that with you. And then we have a bunch of toolkits and stories. They're all free downloads for you. So those may have some stories that can help you move your work forward. So I wanted to share those. And now I will pass it to Emily, I think. Is that? Yes. So Emily, 
and take over. Mm. Emily, you are still muted. How's this? Good, we can hear your voice Thank now. you. I was just saying, June Lee, thanks for putting so many examples out there. And I think what, yeah, you, what you just did and showing us what was happening in so many different communities plays exactly into what I, I wanna talk about now for the next 20 minutes or so. And that's saying, okay, so how do you get your own stories out there? How do you get people to, to respond in the way that I think probably many of us were responding when we were listening to that? So I would just like to deputize all of you and whether you like it or not, make you journalists for a quick moment, make you members of the community. And based upon what you heard from June Lee, uh, I would love to hear what's the biggest question you had about one of these projects? What was the thing that left you saying, I want to know more? And I'd love for you to put that in the chat so you can kind of act as the reporter and we can get a sense of what is it that inspires people to say, I want to know more about that? So of all the projects she just talked about, is there one quick thing that you could put into the chat box if you're listening? about what you wanted to know more about. And as we're waiting for those to come in, Julie, I was fascinated. You didn't tell us exactly how much each one of those cost or who was on the committee for that. Um, all those things are important, right? Maybe where the grant funding came from, but, but why did you focus on the stories to educate us instead of giving us all the nitty gritty of how they arrived at each one of those? We find that the stories La the stories last longer in people's heads. So that's the short answer. Stories last longer. Look at this. Allison is saying, I wanted to know more about the movie in the snow. Absolutely, especially during a pandemic. That's something that was able to be done outside. Wayfinding and how they attached the bikes, right? There's. It drives us to say, I want to know more about how that worked out. I want to learn more about saving, restoring, repurposing old historic buildings. Anything, any any answers that you can give, Julie? First of all, a pop-up splash pad. They have so many requests for splash pads. Or what is the prompt on the triangular flags pinned to the line? What could <laughs> happen here? More details. Um, so what we're seeing is there are so many good questions. Julie, do any quick answers come out from this? Or is that something we may need to follow up on later? I think, you know, because some of the questions are super detailed and often this is where I think people worry and and I want to reassure you that in your community, you would find the right people to figure out how to do this. So like the bicycle attachment, I can tell you how that worked kind of, but I can also tell you that in your community, somebody there with you could solve this problem. Like you don't have to have that information from us. Um, I mean, I can tell they were just like zip tied on <laughs> <laughs> nothing fancy because uh, they were not permanent. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, though, with these really great questions, uh, Caitlin saying, I want I love the creative ways to affordably get community members to see the outcomes. What this shows you, all of you wonderful um, quickly made reporters is that we all have questions, right? We all want to know what's going on. Tell me more. And what I want you to do now is put put your regular hat back on and, and I want to help you do some activities to help get you thinking about how to get that message across to people so they want to know more and also give you a really simple exercise that maybe you can walk your team members, your community through to see where where you may align in messaging and maybe where some surprise messages are. So that's what we're going to focus on for the next little bit, because I, I want to tell you something that's a really horrible thing and also a really wonderful empowering and freeing thing because no matter how great our presentations are June Lee was fantastic there's a lot I'm going to remember from her presentation I hope that I have give you a lot you can remember from your presentation but the fact of the matter is this is just an hour and a half of what is probably a packed day of a packed week of a packed month of a packed year so chances are and this is a study from 19 57, I think, but it still holds true today. After two months, you're probably going to forget 75% of what I say today. No matter how good my presentation is, no matter how much you care, you forget 75%. You know, that's not all that shocking or all that surprising, but here's the number that I think is really important to remember. By the end of the evening, you're probably going to forget a half to a third 
of what I say. And the part that's scary about that is we put so much time into presenting and thinking about what do we want people to know. And, and the reality is they're not going to remember it all. But the thing that's really liberating and freeing about that is, OK, so that gives you a chance to say, what do I want to make sure is the one thing that they do take away? What do I make sure that they are going to remember at the end of the day, at the end of two months? And that really means you have to help focus them and you have to know what your message is. You can't be all things to all people. And this is the exercise I want to give you to help you understand that. Does anybody know, recognize in these pictures, uh, the story of the three little pigs? If we could all talk about it, I would love to hear you tell the story, but I'm gonna tell you the basic story for those of you who may not have heard it for a while, that once upon a time, there was a mother pig who sent her pigs out into the world. And so they had to make it on their own. And the first little pig said, hey, I've got some straw. It's not gonna take me long to put it up. They made a house out of straw and they were happy until the big bad wolf came along and it huffed and it puffed and it blew the house down. So that little pig had to run into the next house where they had taken a little more time, made the house a little more sturdy out of sticks. But you know what happened? The wolf came along, huffed, puffed, blew it down. And suddenly there were two pigs without a place to go. But that third pig had worked so hard while uh, while his siblings were, were just kind of hanging out by their pools, by their straw and wood houses. And they said, what are you doing? And that pig said, I want to make my house out of bricks. And when that wolf came along and huffed and puffed and blew as hard as they could, you know what happened? That house stood, stand, stood strong. And so from that story um, that I told just in probably a minute or so, I want you to think about simplifying that story even more. Could you take the story I just told you and condense it down into a lesson that you want people to know and remember about that story that would be only three words, a three word story about the three little pigs? It may be one saying, build with bricks. The Brick Builders Association may want to say, clearly, if you build with bricks, you keep out the big bad wolves. So this is the best product for you. That could be the story of the three little pigs. But we're getting some other ones that are interesting. Brian's saying, build it right. Yes, Brian wants to tell a story, not that you should buy with bricks because there's a superior product necessarily, but that doing the job the right way is going to pay off. The, the perseverance is brick save pigs. Yeah, that's another way to say we've got this quality product and you can rest assured your family is safe. Anybody have a different take on a lesson from the three little pigs? Maybe that's not about bricks. Built to last, that kind of goes with the product, but is there a different way that you could come up with a lesson? Plan for worse. Yeah, preparation, planning, take more time. You don't have to rush to get it done. An artist knows it's not about the first sketch, it's about what you do. Learn from others. I love that as iterative and a community building and that there's a fact that you can do more share with neighbors. If they don't have as good of a house as you do, you may open up what you have. I love those. Those are really fantastic stories. And you know what? It's so interesting because these are more giving. I have done stories. I'm based out of Washington, D.C., and people have said um, have gone to things that are more government based and say things like who allowed straw and they look to say in government regulations what's wrong with the people who allowed straw why aren't we saying only with bricks uh, figure it out yeah you're empowered to know a solution if you have it these are all really really great stories and what i hope you start to see is they're all stories that apply to the same minute long story that I told you about the three little pigs. But if you're talking to your audience, think about who your audience is, the people you're trying to convince to build a splash pad or to do more historical sites. You want, don't want to tell them this is a story about brick saving pigs and sharing with neighbors and plan for the worst and take more time. If you hit people with all those messages, they're going to say, I don't really know what they want me to do here. I don't know where they're going with this. 
And so if you can work with your organization to say, these are the three words that we basically stand for. It doesn't have to be your, your web page motto, but it's the thing that you're conveying. If the three words are too little, make it one sentence. Make it the thing that anytime people say, so what is it that you're really trying to do here? You can start off with that and then build more and, and so that everyone is answering in the same way. Now, it may be one story is for your donors and one a different story slightly is for maybe the naysayers, right? But if you are uniform with what you want to say and what your message is, it's going to start to be that when people think eight hours later, what was it that they really wanted me to do? You have they remember the answer. You have made it very clear. This sounds simple, but I have seen uh, teams and companies transformed by this. If you can get people to sit down and say, these are the three words that we stand for, or maybe the three words for each category of people, it helps them focus. I was in Denver with a, uh, a global sales leader who was presenting to his national sales meeting on Monday, and he had a beautifully written speech. It was 20 minutes long. It had lots of details. It was really good. And my job was to just help him convey it a little bit better. And so I said, put your script down for a moment. Let's turn off the teleprompter. What is it that you want to leave people with? And he had to think for about 15 minutes about what was the biggest driver that he wanted to come out of that 20 minutes. He basically came down to his build with bricks idea or build it right or figure it out. Your choices matter. He came down with what mattered to him and being able to hone in on that helped change the way he presented. It helped him connect with his audience. Um, it can be really hard to do, but hold yourself accountable and take people through this to find out where you stand. And then once you know what your three words are, then you start building around it. There's an article that I think we'll be sending you a link to a little bit later that talks about data. That doesn't necessarily mesh with it's really important because listen to this quote people hear statistics but they see stories statistics aren't going to be the things that stick with them uh, by the end of the day or two months later stories will we're going to remember what happened with that splash pad by people saying let's put out some pvc pipes and some plastic and show people that kids will show up and who cares about it you're going to remember those stories more than you would remember the proposed cost was 2.3 million that was going to be funded between these two things. Statistics matter and they come next to support it so that you show you have uh, the details and know what you're doing, but you you bring people in with the stories. This is a lesson that you would think I just know intrinsically as a reporter who's told tens of thousands of stories literally from across the country, but sometimes you forget because I'm a policy driven person. I like politics and it's interesting June Lee talked about Hurricane Katrina and communities because I want to give you a lesson that I learned from Hurricane Katrina. You know what happened with that hurricane and one of the things that was so striking that happened was there were more than a million people displaced so many of them went to hurricane relief shelters and a quarter million of their pets were stranded, right? Those are numbers that are true and, and pretty striking, right? So that's one way you can tell a story. You can just tell people, can you believe how many people and how many of their pets were without a home? It's not bad. It's just not particularly something that's going to stick with you on this. Maybe you say, okay, I want to help show people that. So you might pull up a graphic. This is one from uh, the Centers for Disease Control that showed of those displaced people, where did they go? Um, where were the shelters? The darker the color red, the more uh, relief centers there were evacuation centers. And so you can see it makes sense. More people went to places like Texas and Mississippi and Louisiana. A few made their way up through Missouri and even into Wisconsin. And in this tiny little pullout that you can see, there's Washington, D.C. that has one. So I could say, hey, some of the people went to Washington, D.C., and it gives you an idea of, of, of how many went there versus Texas. This is another good way to tell the story. It starts to bring it a little bit more alive to people. They can connect and say, uh huh, I live in North Dakota. Nobody came here, but the closest one was in Colorado, right? It helps to give people something to tie on to and connect it. 
But then there's the third way to tell the story. And I got to tell you, I was in Washington, D.C. in local television news at the time. And I was assigned to go to that one center in Washington, D.C. It was right here at the D.C. Armory and tell a story about the people who were there. And so I thought I want to tell the statistics story. I want to talk about how many people are here and, and what they've been through. But my assignment desk said, no, we want you to go because Shaquille O'Neal, who it was a wonderful thing that Shaquille O'Neal did, and this is not in any way critical of what he did, but we want you to cover Shaquille O'Neal talking to the, the evacuees. And I thought, you know, seems like that has a little bit backwards. Maybe we should talk about the evacuees first. They said, no, we really want Shaquille O'Neal. And I fought that assignment and I lost. And so I had to do a story that night about Shaquille O'Neal coming to visit everyone. But when I was there, I also noticed that man that you see in the picture who was holding a sign. And his sign said, I want to find my dog, Sassy. Well, it turned out that his name was Craig Peel. He was a man, a retiree, a veteran who had literally no family in New Orleans. And he was getting evacuated in his boat. And at the last minute, they said, you can't bring your, you can't bring your dog, Sassy, along with you. You have to leave it behind. So he literally had to look to see who was there, handed it off to a neighbor, only knew the neighbor's name was Ginger. And then he gets on a bus and ends up in Washington, D.C. OK, so suddenly, instead of saying there are a million people displaced and a quarter million animals that don't have a place to go, suddenly we had Craig Peel and Sassy and we had a story. And so I told that story. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to show it to you, but we will give you a link later on so that you can watch it. It is not a great story. It is not the <laughs> best work that I've ever done. It is, however, some of the most viral work that I've ever done. This story got shared over and over and over again. And this was at the time of Hurricane Katrina. Social media was in a much different earlier stage than it is right now. But wouldn't you know that people looked at Craig Peel and said, hey, we can help him get an apartment. We can help him get health care and dental care. And we can help him get things like a vacuum cleaner. People saw that story and they wanted to reach out and help Craig Peel. And then what's the question if you're playing a reporter or a member of your community? You're probably thinking, did he get his dog back? When I told that story, I did not think we would get Sassy back because all we knew was it was somewhere in New Orleans flooded with no power and all the damage with someone named Ginger. But our story got shared with someone who knew who Ginger was. And then the Animal Rescue League in Washington went down to that area, found Sassy, brought it back, and Craig Peel and Sassy were reunited. It was a remarkable story to see what going beyond policy could do when you were touching people with what they cared about, the impact it could make. And so I tell you this to say, don't forget in the midst of all the details that you have to be a part of when you're trying to, to help your community through the arts, don't forget to find the magic and say, what do people really care about here? In this case, they said, where's Sassy, right? And so I thought it had an amazing impact, but then a few years later, I found the other impact that happened. And I think this is something important to remember as well. I was presenting at a crisis communications course uh, with FEMA and I, I happened to mention this story and they said, we know this story. And this was about 10 years later. And I said, you remember my story from 10 years ago? I thought that's remarkable. They did it. What they knew was the story of Sassy had been shared as they were doing congressional hearings and studies and follow up. And when they did, Sassy's story was one that ended up impacting what became uh, House Resolution 3858, the Pets Evacuation uh, and Transportation Standards Act, which basically means because of Sassy, in part, if there's a natural disaster where you live, your pet will have to have a contingency plan. The government will have to have a way to help take care of your pet and get them with you so that you are not separated in the same way that Craig Peel and Sassy were. This story that I almost didn't want to do in the first place because I didn't think it was important with Shaquille O'Neal talking to the evacuees ended up being something that changed lives all across the country, not even just Craig Peel and Sassy. There are things that happen when you find the stories that connect with people that you may never even have imagined. And so I just want you to think about the differences. What I want you to think about is when you are telling your story, 
If all you're telling people is what it is, what this project is, you're only going part way. You need to get to the why. Why does this story matter to you? If you can't answer that, the people are not going to connect with it in that way. Here's another very quick example for you. Um, for those of you who might be slightly uh, engineered, uh, engineer mind, can you take a look at this flow chart for the Janicki Omni processor? I don't expect that you may know what it is, but if you just take a second and look at it, anybody have any ideas for what this is a chart of, what this is telling us about? I'm not expecting perfect answers, but anybody have any ideas? Let me tell you, my brain, waste or water? Absolutely, Sarah's right on. This is not the way my brain works. I get a little turned off by flow charts and things that look that look um, technical, but she's exactly right. Waste incineration. The Janicki Omni processor, as it turns out, was something that um, Bill Gates was trying to, to work on and fund because in the country of Senegal, they had a problem with wastewater. There was too much wastewater and there wasn't enough purified water. So listen, if you're Bill Gates and you want to tell people in the US, here's what the Janicki Omni processor can do in Senegal, the, the problem is how many of us, frankly, are going to take an interest in that? How many of us are going to care? We may we may be passing interested, but but really how is that chart of something really important, getting humans drinkable water, how's that chart going to affect us? This is the what. And it's critical, we need the what to make it happen, but it doesn't get to the why. So what did he do instead? He went to a place where you may not think of going. <laughs> he went on Jimmy Fallon to talk about, for lack of a better word, poop water. I have a link to this video to show you what he did because you kind of need to watch all three minutes and 56 seconds to get a, a full idea. But he basically took two bottles of water and he said, one of these bottles is drinking water. The other glass of water is, they were glasses. And the other glass of water is water from, it's poop water. It's water from the, the processor. And so which one do you want to drink, Jimmy? I'll drink the other. So you see this whole thing of they're, they're kind of having this little song and dance about who's going to drink what. Jimmy Fallon finally says, I'm, I'm going to drink this one. He drinks it. And then he says, which one was it? Anybody want to guess? Bill Gates said, Jimmy Fallon, you just drank the poop water. And you see the, you know, the spit take that comes from that. And then, and then Bill Gates says, but so is this one. This is drinkable water. Okay, so suddenly he told us why this matters, that it truly was something that you could drink. It's the sort of thing that sticks with you beyond eight hours, that sticks with you past two months. You're going to remember that this machine has the power to potentially change lives and make it something that's safe to drink. Think about creative ways that you can tell the whys to your audience. In doing so, you know, you want to think of the, a couple of different ways, and I think this really applies to the arts. One is be active. Uh, instead of just showing the flow chart, show people the glasses and have them decide which one they want to drink from. Be surprising. If you are the first one that has done it in your community, talk about the fact that you are the first one. Or if there's something that struck you in the process that you said, you know, we were expecting this outcome and then we had this change of events. Tell other people about that change of events. Bring them along for the ride. If it took you by surprise, it will take them by surprise, and they're going to remember it. Be different. If there are 20 communities in your state who have just received a grant, you don't want to be one of 20 that received a grant. You might be the first one in your the first time in your community's history that this grant has ever been received. Look for the words, the new, better, first, that really help people look up and pay attention. Be positive. 
sometimes it's hard not to say, you know, we, we're having problems with funding, we're having problems uh, with this, and, and telling people the challenge to overcome. Instead, you might want to just reframe it and say, here's what we know we can do, here's how close we are, here's what we're showing, here's how you can contribute. Keeping that positive even when you're exhausted is important. And then the final one I think is so key, it's being authentic. Now, so often we have to uh, rely upon others, we think, to tell our stories because we think that it has to be in the local newspaper or it has to be on the local television station. Social media gives you the opportunity to have your authentic voice stand out, and that can be so critical. I don't know how many of you follow uh, a cowboy museum out of Oklahoma City. I certainly did not follow that until the pandemic, when they had their security guard take over the Twitter account when the hotel, when the museum was closed and start just sharing his authentic ideas about, look at this cool thing. I wonder what's going on. That authentic voice was so powerful that they ended up getting on NPR, they were on CNN, they were in uh, Leisure Travel, Travel and Leisure Magazine. That story was getting picked up because it was someone not trying to be, uh, not trying to be a social media star. They were just sharing their, here's what's going on voice. And I think that's especially important, be authentic. And for that, it, you don't have to take a lot of time. Um, I had a, a son, a 13 year old son who did a baseball fundraiser and he said, well, I don't want this to be about me. So he put up a picture of a baseball when he did the fundraiser. Guess what? It didn't get anything. Nobody cared about a generic uh, clip art picture of a baseball. So then he changed it to a, a unique picture of him with some of the gear he gathered. He started to get a lot more donations. And then he took his iPhone and we went to three different spots throughout DC. He wrote a quick minute long script. We shot it on his iPhone. We put a little bit of generic music that we had purchased the rights to. We knew there were the public access rights to it. He got thousands of dollars because people saw this iPhone video that he edited in literally less than 10 minutes. This was not a work of art, but it was his authentic voice. It was cheap and easy, but creative and gripping and people donated it to it. Be authentic and you can be that voice and you don't have to rely upon what they do. My final quick thought is, as I said, I'm from Iowa and the Midwest. This is my town, Osage, Iowa. It's a population about 3,658. There's a Pulitzer Prize winner who came through here, a couple of Olympic athletes who have come here. There's a, a notebook where I do my news notebooks uh, they are often printed in this town that watts theater that you see in that you see in the back has received one of the most picturesque movie theaters in the country awards from usa today and there's a, a, a fox river mill woolen mill that makes uh, socks for the military and for our community so it has a lot of things to offer in this little town but what it didn't have was a really good place for the arts they in fact call it a cafe gymnatorium which basically meant whether you were you were in the same room where you ate, where the school musical was, where the school show choir performed, where the school band was, all of those things I did in a big echoey gym because the community didn't have it. Well, the mayor, Steve Cooper, and uh, Joyce Relo, who's a community member back in 2006 said, well, what does our community want? And so they started talking to people, they started figuring it out. And instead of building, instead of making a list of things, they said, we don't want a cafe gymnatorium. We want everything. Let's try to get everything in our community. They went with three words like education is key. They started addressing all the alumni of the school and saying, here's what we have. Here's what we think we can do. They started saying to donors, what would you like to see? How can we help you bring your goals for our community to life instead of asking for direct money? And then they started saying, we have something for everyone. They said, if you're interested in helping to pick out the athletic equipment, we've got a committee for that. If you're interested in a community fundraiser, we've got a chair of that committee. They started saying, we have something for everyone. And from that, they ended up building uh, the Cedar uh, River complex. It has a museum, it has a pool, it has a theater, it has a, a recreation center, there's a separate event center. There have been all of these things that have happened, including things that they never 
expected. As I was talking with them, they were saying, you know, they never expected that the theater, the arts would be anything more necessarily than just just for the community. But instead, someone from Minneapolis, two and a half hours away, said we could have a summer stock theater and we could perform in that. And so now for the past few years, kids from all across the country have been coming to Osage, Iowa and presenting music in the summer, learning how to present the arts, learning how to be something that happened because they said in our community, we believe there can be something for everyone. I think it's such an example of how thinking big and, and telling that story to your community can lead to things happening in your community that you never dreamed of. My favorite thing saying is if you don't tell your story, someone else will. I hope this gives you some ideas of how you can start to tell your story and see what chapters are there that you never even imagined. So I thank you for your time and want to bring it back to Jun Lee um, and all of you for any questions you have for the both of us. So if people want to drop, drop questions, questions into the chat, the chat that's, great. that's great. Um, I don't know if we have the capacity to unmute folks as well. Um, Stephanie, let me know about that. If folks do raised hands, could we unmute if people want to ask verbally? Yes, we can. Great. So if folks want to raise hands, we could do that. Um, I do want to thank our presenters while we're waiting on some questions to come in. I think um, a lot of the, the questions that or the, the ideas that were presented early on um, that people were interested in hearing about in terms of connecting with different constituencies in their communities and bringing together people around ideas that maybe uh, people who are maybe resistant to change. I think a lot of what uh, Emily and June Lee touched on can um, are great tools for bringing folks um, along on those things. So I, I'm hoping that folks feel like they heard things today that um, addressed some of the questions and interests that they had at the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to so while while you all think of more questions uh, to drop in there, raise your hand, I was going to um, I scanned the chat and there are a couple things. So I know Caitlin um, asked about how to. Um, Caitlin said, I want to know more of how to make nonprofits in more of the conversations and partners in what is happening at the local government level um, or control. And um, I don't, Caitlin, I don't know if you're asking as, um, you know, somebody who works for an organization or as an individual artist. But I think one of the things that we like to say is, you know what, get out there and meet people. Um, if you're an individual artist or community member, you know, find out what local organizations seem to be doing work in your area or in your interest area and have an informational meeting. Uh, if you're staff, you know, go make that effort to meet with staff from other organizations or groups in the community without a specific um, goal in mind. Like, not, you know, you don't meet somebody when there's a deadline a week from that day uh, and that you have to rush into a relationship, but really meet people and say, like, what do you do? What are, you know, what are you facing? Um, what are your passions? And then, hey, also here are some of mine and maybe there's a way we could work together. Um, I think, you know, speaking as a staff member of an organization, we're always saying, like, what are you working on that we can support with the resources or the capacities that we have? We know we do certain things well, but we don't do everything. What do you what are you doing and what could we help you with? Um, and even just having that curiosity and openness, uh, you know, in the end, it comes back. Right. Sometimes we're like, well, I'm, I'm going to meet I'm, I'm meeting with so and so, but who knows what will happen? I can tell you, particularly as artists, meet with organizations. Somewhere down the line, that organization will be like, oh, we have this interesting opportunity to work in a different way. And you know what? I met I met Caitlin a few months ago. Let me go back and talk to her again. So I want to just encourage you to have those kinds of uh, informational meetings. Um, and then the question, there was a question about, let's see. Um, experiencing resistance from the people who are doing well under our current system and how do we encourage change um, while assuring those folks that they won't be any worse for it that's a tough one right uh, you you ask a question there's so much uh, context 
around that that I can't know or that we can't know uh, right in this format. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, people people are scared of change. A lot of people we've been taught to be scared um, of change, and that includes we've been taught to be scared of the unfamiliar, and that includes people who aren't like ourselves, right? That's what the media tells us. That's what we hear. Um, and so some of this work is just about giving people low risk ways to meet one another, right? To meet people who aren't doing so well under the current system or who are, you know, silenced or have less of a voice. So the other thing I want to say about that is sometimes when you're grappling with a challenge in your community, you're like, how do we solve this, right? Let's say you know that in your community, some people don't feel welcome. Um, you can throw that question out at creatives. You can say, what would you do to help people feel welcome here, right? And then see what they come up with. And I can tell you, artists will have a million and one different ways to do that. And then you can do some of those with them and then see what happens and grow from there. So some of the toughest questions we say, I don't, we can't answer that, but ask artists. All right, Emily, are there? Thank you, Julie. So here's a question for you. Yeah. I see a question from Stephen um, asking, in my experience, who are the best natural storytellers in rural communities? Uh, they're the people who say, oh, you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> they're the shyest ones. They're the ones that you have to that you have to draw out. I think Jun Lee brings up a really good point of, of looking to the people who, who may not be the ones out at the forefront. Not that those aren't leaders and that they don't have an important say, but if you already know what everyone else has to say, look for some of the others. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, what the, one of the stories that I did that was honored the most and won a national award and there were network anchors who saw it and said that's amazing was not a remarkable story to me it was a story that many in rural communities may know there had been a, a death in the family in fact it was a father-son farming operation and both had died over the year and so when it was fall and it was time to take out the crops everyone in the community came together and in the space of a day took out this farmer's crops. And so for me, growing up on a farm, I had seen that story play out over and over and over again because that's just what neighbors do. Um, but I interviewed neighbors because I understood and I asked them questions not like, do you think you're a hero? But what do you think it would have meant to Farmer Bill to, ha to see this happening on his land? And they were able to talk about it they didn't want to talk about themselves, but they were really proud to talk about that was a good farmer and this is what that meant and what that day meant. And I think that was what resonated with people who, who were from an urban area who could not believe that that was the way people worked and did things. And so I think one of the best ways to find those natural storytellers or those underrepresented voices is not to ask people talk about themselves, but just say, what do you think people, other people might want out of this space? Because in, in the where I grew up, it was often don't talk about yourself, talk about talk about others and um, don't bring attention to yourself. And so I think you have to approach it in a way that helps people feel comfortable that they're not bragging about what their accomplishments are or what they want, but they're they're trying to help others out. And that's how I always found in rural communities the best natural storytellers. They were the ones who weren't raising their hands. Let's see, I see some other um, questions. So Brian's asking about replicating the artists in residence at the bus stop and intersection uh, and wanting more details. I probably could get you some a few more details um, about the activities that Kristen did there. Um, but, you know, she she really as an artist, that's what she proposed. We didn't say, hey, we need somebody to you know, work with the Department of Transportation and this intersection. She really said, I'm curious about this. Uh, I, and she's a little nerdy, right? And she's like, I'm kind of nerdy about this. Uh, and I have these projects, all these ideas, and I wanna know like, what happens if I just hang out here? And I, you know, she did an alley cleanup. Uh, one of the photos she did like a, um, this is the, in the days before drones. And so she did like a photo project where, you know, she had a camera tied to a helium balloon. Uh, so she was able to really tackle, sort of look at the big picture, but using her own interests. So I can, you know, Brian, you can email me later and, and we can connect a little more. Um, 
but I, I think, you know, all you need to know is you want to replicate it somehow and the concept alone can be enough to run with. <laughs> I see some other questions um, that sort of popped up in the chat. Um, one is around uh, Jackie's in northern Wisconsin says, we'd love to help our town look like it's full of artists because it is, but you would never know that driving or walking through it. Um, I'm an organizer, so the first thing I think about is, well, you just have to bring those artists together and they will have many, many ideas <laughs> about how to do that. Um, so I think that's the first step. Say, hey, artists, let's get together for an hour and a half. You know, and I bet you not all those artists know each other. Um, when I had a job in a neighborhood, the first, one of the first things I do did was just sort of throw out a, a call for artists to show up. And um, 12 of them did, and they got to talking. And even though the goal was never to work together, by the end of that hour and a half, they had a list of things that they were all interested in pursuing. Um, so I think that's one a first step for you. But also that question, if you you know, um, if you had like a little bit of funding, you could also say, hey, how would you showcase whether it's yourself or the fact that there are other artists here? And they would come up with all kinds of ideas. They would say, hey, look, you know, there are a couple storefronts that maybe you have some vacant storefronts. Can we have artists do something with those things? Do you have um, spaces that they could use? They'll come up with so many things. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. I think the other the other thing that can help with that is too often you we all put out our message only when we have something that we think people need to hear right we we if we have a big event coming up you put it out there and then expect that people will just like wait around for six months until the next time you're there I think as you're telling your story use social media to just give people pretty regular reminders of little things that are are going on you know maybe it was is a is, is a special day that somebody has done or a special piece of art that's been going on. It's letting people know that you're there all the time so that when you need to call on them to act, they're familiar with who you are. You know, it gets hard for us because we do something day in and day out and expect everyone else is thinking about us that same amount. And it's just simply not true. So if you can keep that slow and steady but engaging drumbeat up, I saw from my high school yesterday um, that they, they had a simple thing about in, in one of the classes they were working on flower design. And so they took the top six <coughs> students had done and said, vote on which one is your favorite. You know, that's not it probably took them 45 seconds to make that posting, but it helped people engage and realize all the different things that were going on in the in the arts programs right so just little things that you can do to engage your audience so that when it does come to when you really need them or you're really looking for resources they know and trust you i think that that's an important thing that we too often put aside um looking at some of the other comments also so i think catherine says would really like to see civic engagement by underrepresented audiences in our community um, we work with lots of places that, you know, the question is, how do we reach the people who don't, who we normally can't reach? And part of that, like I mentioned, is finding the artists in those communities because the artists have, you know, they're sort of already thinking about their own creativity and wanting to share, right? That is one thing about artists. They aren't making art to just keep for themselves, right? Whatever they make or do their process is ultimately outward facing. Um, and so, but the step to finding those artists is one that can sometimes people are like, how do you find artists? And I think here the question is like, what are, are there community groups? Are there organizations like that are cultural organizations or um, that, that serve or are of those underrepresented groups? And can you go to them and understand what they're doing, what they're facing, what they're you know trying to achieve and also looking for the creative folks through them or through collaboration with them um it's it is definitely this work can be an excuse or and an opportunity to work with groups that you don't normally um get to reach so i think you know rather than trying to throw out an advertisement for artists out there uh, a better way would be to approach some organizations and groups that are of those communities already um and then there's this this one carly says 
Uh, I definitely need help reaching my city council and community members. I feel like our community is at a standstill for change because our city isn't very open to change. Now that's really broad, right? So I can't obviously comment on any specific details, but it does remind me that, you know, change can be slow, but it also can be fast. And what, you know, in our early work um, around that construction project, we just said, let's just Ha invite artists to do whatever they want, except it has to be on this construction corridor and they have to do it in collaboration with a business or an organization on that corridor. So those were the only two requirements and the artists had to be from those communities and they did all those different things. And one of the things that was an unexpected outcome was that a number of individual artists worked with, you know, ended up working with one or one or two organizations and those organizations changed. So there was a economic development organization that served Asian businesses and multiple artists did small projects with some of the Asian businesses over a couple years. And the development organization was like, oh, this brings, you know, this brings bodies into these businesses. This brings new customers into these businesses when artists do these projects. And then the business organization said, well, we need to actually start supporting this work. Um, and so it wasn't we didn't approach it from like, oh, you need to change. And and so let's figure out how to do that. But we just said, what happens if we help seed some relationships and then people get to the like, oh, you know, doing things differently actually may get us some good results. So that's just an example of um, you know, sort of trying things out and not worrying too much about like, we need to solve this now, but some baby steps and really relationship building. And I think it would, in doing so, look look for the sassy story. Look for, instead of telling people, we've got a quarter million dogs out there and, and cats without a place to go, what, what, what community can help a quarter million pets, right? If they're a community of 40,000 or 4,000 or 50,000. But if you say, here's a dog and here's somebody who, who took an effort to do this, and so we think there's an initiative for our community to become this, you start to convince people, you start with, you start with what tears, pulls at their heartstrings, and then you talk to their head because the head part still matters. And I think that that's something that sounds so simple, but trust me, I've sat through a lot of legislative hearings and city council and people get up there and they go slide, slide, slide. Let me show you bar, bar chart, graph chart statistic, and it's forgotten. You've got to show them why it matters and why this is going to change a community. Present a problem you need to solve. Present who can be a hero. Look for the things, the storylines that make us sit and watch something on Netflix and look for that same kind of storyline opportunity for them. You hit them with just the statistics and they're going to say, now we can we we can move on to the next agenda item because it's just too hard to take those baby steps that Julian was talking Julie was talking about. So look for look for the ways that you can pull them in with the stories and tell them what their opportunity is to change something. Excellent, Julie. I don't know if you saw any other things you want to comment on. Um, if not, I think we can wrap up here. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's it. Um, Fantastic. Well, yes. thank you both so much. Um, this has been really inspiring and exciting. Thank you all for attending and joining us. Um, we have a, a survey here um, that we would love for you to fill out and let us know how we can do this differently or better next time. Um, and you'll get a follow up email with links to uh, the recording as well as uh, the slides and things like that for uh, for your records. Um, but we really appreciate you all joining today and um, hope you stay safe out there and uh, keep in touch. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Be in touch.